So when when you're playing flat, well, like like I teach a lot of people, it's kind of swings between sharp and flat, right? Uh, but when I, when people play flat uh, chronically, it's generally a, uh, um, a misunderstanding of what the notes should sound like when they're in tune. You know what I mean? Like so, that it's kind of a good enough thing type thing, and they just don't really kind of. You know, once you point it out to them, it's like, oh, yeah. And then they start to hear it and then they come up and it's fine. So it's an ear training thing, you know, whereas the sharpness is more of a mechanical issue where when you're playing the 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 left hand kind of starts to do this. And it happens to the best of us. It happens to everybody. My dad's teacher used to say, as you play the violin, even for the great masters, as you play the violin, the violin wants to do this, and your hand wants to do this. And if you don't keep it up and out, it's going to just keep doing that. See that? Ah. So that's the solution, then, is to keep, keep keep the thing up. Keep it up? Yep. And that's, you know, that's what they used to always say, like, like you know, come on now, get that arm up. Uh, and also, I find more than anything is to relax the left hand. If you keep the left hand relaxed, it, it really doesn't creep up the neck near as much as when you pinch it. And I'll tell you what happens. When you pinch that neck and you move from string to string, she goes right up there like that little toy at Christmas time with the guy that shimmies up the telephone pole. Right. Up she goes, you know. Uh, and that's when you have a little bit of a pinch. So you got to avoid that. Now, and like I said, it happens to everybody. It happens to me. It happens when I get tired, third hour of the dance. I feel the skin on my hands start to pull, and I know that I'm starting to, you know, do that. So I gotta, I breathe and I relax, relax back to place. Okay. Okay. I will keep that in mind. Thank you yeah. very, very much. Yeah. No problem. No problem at all. Very common thing. I had one poor lady, my God, she was chronically coming up the neck. She just couldn't help it. And she had a bit of tartan hanging off the end of her fiddle. And I actually remember one day I was like, why don't you just tie your hand to that bit of tartan? <laughs> anyway, she yeah. got the better of it. She finally got the better of it. One thing that really helped her, and it helps a lot of people, and in fact with Suzuki, they kind of make it part of the deal, is they take a, uh, a, a little sticker, a puffy sticker. Now in Suzuki, they use a corn plaster. Do you know those things? The little little uh, sticky donuts that you put on a on a wart or something on your foot. Oh, yeah, like yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's called a corn plaster. And in Suzuki, they'll actually take the corn plaster and put it on the fiddle right where the knuckle of your thumb, this part of your thumb here, is oh. supposed to go into it. See that? And it'll and the knuckle the knuckle will sink right into that corn plaster the hole of the corn plaster and stay there and like it's I find it to be a really good thing actually especially for kids because you can get them early you know work on that problem because like I said it it, it uh, plagues everybody um, I find also though for most people like I was working with a girl today Alice she's an Irish uh, girl she's uh, uh, been here for about ten years or something like that. And uh, she has a puffy sticker on her fiddle, and it's really helping her to keep the to keep the thumb from from coming up the fiddle. Okay, well, I can see myself going into Shoppers Drug Mart tomorrow and and getting some corn plasters. You might and, not uh, need it. Now, that's the other thing, and this is for everybody, because like I said, everybody has this problem. Everybody is susceptible to this problem, so you might not need it. That is an extreme. Okay. You might just need to keep it in mind and, and relax the hand and it'll stay in place. If it's a chronic yeah. issue, you might need to go the route of the corn plaster. You see what I mean? Or the or another guy I had once, he was chronically going up the neck and he was getting so frustrated. I said one day, what you need is a taser. <laughs> Whoa. Yeah. Or like that invisible dog fence that people put in their that's yard. Right, that's right. Them. That's what you need. Little line. Yeah. There you go. She's got one. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, it's it's interesting because it points out a, a very common difficulty that people have. Oh, and I should say that when the speed goes up, that goes up too. 
big time. Yeah. Okay. Well, I made up my mind I wasn't going to try to impress you with speed I don't have. So <laughs> that's good. And the rhythm was nice and steady. That's really, you know, that's the key to going fast is having good steady rhythm. So when the speed goes yeah. up, nothing gets affected. So I thought that was quite good. The good part of it really. Okay. Good. Thank you. And how are you doing, Paul? Great. Uh, good yeah. to see you, Dan. Uh, I have a question, actually follow up question about intonation. So what's yeah. your take slash advice on practicing with a tuner for it, like pr working on intonation by using a tuner? I'm, I'm That's hearing a good very different, yeah, very different opinions. On that. Now, what's your opinion? Have you tried to use the tuner? Uh, okay, so my opinion so you can see behind there, I have this uh, on my ukulele back there. I have that red. Uh, that's like the snark all instrument the tuner snark. that everyone kind of recommends. It's yep. supposed to work with any instrument. So yep. the the one in my background there, uh, yeah. there, yeah. And, I recognize and it. So so yeah. So when I try when I use it for for my for my violin for my fiddle when I'm trying to practice intonation, it's like super annoying because there's a big delay. That yeah. one has a big delay. And it also, I think it picks up overtones because sometimes I'll play D and it says it's it's picking up a G, you know, or like something else. Like it'll it'll pick up like some, because there's like over, I think that's what it's doing is picking up. So then I got this thing here, um, that which I saw a lot of people use. And this one, the delay is much shorter, but I also find it, I just like, I like I'll turn it on for a little bit and then I'll turn it off and I'll just try to, I just try to use, I, I just try to use like either like double stops or like that kind of like resonant feeling you get for certain notes. Like when it starts to resonate with the other string, I try not to use this cause I just feel like it's like super annoying. You want to just get it like perfectly bang on. But like, I think like you don't have to get it super exact. Like this is almost too sensitive, but that's, uh, that's just my opinion. I, I don't know. Okay. But then again, I listen to myself. So when I listen to myself, I felt like my fr first finger was flat on that on that version that I sent you of that. Like I felt my intonation was actually off, and you said my think, intonation was okay. Uh, okay, I can't remember now, but uh, now okay. So first of all, you make a really a few very good points about that working with the tuner. So first of all, the Snark tuner is an excellent tuner for getting your rig in tune when you're on the stage at a bar where it's loud and there's other ignorant bastards next to you banging on guitars and everything when you're trying to get in tune right so it's excellent for that not so good for practicing because it is quite slow and it doesn't really it only goes it only gives you like like it builds up from the bottom and goes up to the to the uh note which is kind of a weird way of looking at it like because it's not really like that it's like the note is in the middle and there could be either side it's not like not like you're you're building yeah. up to it. So I find that part of it weird. So I don't find it good for practicing at all. Also, the one on your fiddle, I don't find that very good for practicing either because it doesn't show you how much at a tune you are. And I've seen the I've had a lot of experience with both of those tuners. Um, I find the best tuner for practicing is, and I got it from my wife, who's got who's got three degrees in music, so I always like to point that out. Uh, is called tunable without the e tunable and i'll show you what it looks like because i use it it's it's great because you can use it right on your computer screen and i have it on all the time now the reason here it is here see that now i'll show you how it works and it crashed because i was using the metronome earlier that's one thing that bugs me if you go between the tuner and the metronome it crashes See that? Yeah. We can see it. We can't hear you, though. I don't know if you want us to hear you, but. Oh, I gotta, gotta put, the... Yeah, I gotta put the thing on here. One sec. Oh, I gotta stop sharing. Do this thing. Start sharing again. <laughs> there. Okay. Oh, and there's, where's my tuner? There it is. Okay. See that? The 
it's, it's a very easy to look at tuner. Uh, it shows you in the uh, in the top left corner what note you're trying to tune. It also shows you what octave it is. See that little three there? That's what octave it is. So like a, your A string is A4. So the fourth A from the bottom of the piano. See what I mean? Uh, and uh, then the other thing is, is that you were talking about the overtones. And fiddles create overtones. It's because of the temperament. It's equal temper. Well, it's not tempered. It's equal temperament. So when it's in tune with itself, it kind of makes a, 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 a couple of notes, really. And, and uh, it's called overtones. You're absolutely right. Now, it really is apparent when you're at a tune, uh, when you play double stops, because that's when you can hear the overtones clashing. Okay, uh, that's and double stops are a really excellent way of working on your intonation. This tuner here, you see this heart monitor thing that's going all crazy, like I'm failing a lie detector test. That tu that is an overtone tuner. Okay, so when I play my A string, you're gonna see what that thing does. <laughs> see how it's given me a fairly wavy line just right down the middle and it only really spikes when I change direction with the bow. See that? So that's the overtone part of the tuner. And I, although you can't really hear that when you're playing a single note, you wouldn't be able to tell whether it was uh, sharp or flat in the overtones. If you played a double stop, you would really tell. Okay. Also, what that you is useful for is just the, the what you notice there when it spiked when I changed my bow direction. It can be really good to, to, to judge the smoothness of your bow. See that? That was a nice smoothly running bow. Now here's one that's hesitant. See that? So I have a lot of people that use that just to kind of get, make take a look at it and make sure their bow is moving smoothly in a visual way okay now so that's the overtones that you're talking about most tuners cannot hear overtones most tuners when they hear because basically it's two notes at the same time so most tuners when you play two notes at the same time it gets too confused it can't it doesn't compute okay this particular tuner the tunable and any other app like it really there's a like hundred of them just as good uh, it can hear two notes at the same time and it'll usually tell you which one is out of tune out of the two notes that you're playing unless it's both and then it kind of does this crazy thing uh, and so uh, anyway so that can be very useful for that now watch while I play double stops <laughs> that nice smooth overtones there it's it's bang on the money so I find this to be a great tool for working on intonation but it's very important that you use it the right way uh, because if you don't use it the right way then exactly like you said Paul you get into a big fight with the video game tuner and you're gonna beat this video game, God damn it! And 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 it's like impossible, you know. It's a, and the other thing about intonation, especially on the fiddle, is that it's target practice. So when you first start trying to play in tune, you're lucky to get the dart on the same board as the uh, same wall as the board, right? As you do it, you get closer. Nobody ever plays bang on all the time, and nobody. And you shouldn't try. It's not like it's not a thing. It's like you're always just trying to get close to the mark, and sometimes when you don't quite hit it, it's nice, you know. Uh, but what playing in tune does for you is that it gives you confidence. So, like you said, when you hear that natural resonance of the violin, when you're playing, you're playing a D or an A and you know it's in tune, your bow arm will move freely and nicely, you know? Whereas when you're wondering or when you're staring at a tuner, the brakes go on like crazy. So I find the best way to work with the tuner, and this is what I still do, is have it adjacent. So when I go in the studio, especially when I'm working for somebody, so if somebody asks me to play on their recording, which I gotta do, next couple of weeks with this Irish guy right so I'll go in there 
and I'll put the tuner on the music stand. I'll get my fiddle nicely in tune, and then I'll put it adjacent. And as I'm playing, I kind of glance over there, and mostly I just do it for the great big dopamine hit that is that green screen. I love that. Oh, nothing better than the screen filling out nice and green the whole time you're playing, you know? Uh, but, like I said, does wonders for my bow. So, if I'm doing a solo break on a song, for instance, and I look, glance over and that screen is green, I'm just like, you, you know? Uh, and if I see that it's a little sliver of red, I can, I can fix it almost right away and then, and then still be off to the races. Okay? The other thing, and I heard this quote the other day, not long ago, from a really good trumpet player that tr plays for the Hamilton Symphony, and he said, Fritz Chrysler is uh, uh, known as saying, I don't play more in tune than anybody else. I just fix it quicker than anybody else. <laughs> and I love that because that's kind of how I do it. Okay. Now, does that answer your question about the tuner? Yes, very, very much so. Thank you. That was really now, the helpful. other thing is, is that you're talking about the reactivity of the tuner right and it's a very important part of practicing with a tuner let's see if i have it so i have an old tuner this thing used to be my buddy oh here it is when i was uh, on tour in ireland this thing was my my best friend the ca the ca1 the cork there you go see it's the best tuner it's a, and and the thing is i worked in a music store and my wife was looking for a tuner that would hear the low range of the, of the tuba because many of them don't. Uh, and this one was the cheapest and this was the only one that would hear the low end of the tuba. Also, it's, it, it's, it uh, reacts right away. Like it goes right with your bow. It's got this nice little dial there. Now, the only, I don't want you, I don't think you should go out and get one of these, but if you can find one, they're awesome. Uh, but, uh, uh, the reason I mention this one is because, for some reason, when I was on tour, the green light didn't work. That shows you when you're in tune. And uh, and also, what was the other thing that didn't work? I can't remember. So anyway, it was kind of like a reverse tuner, which I found really useful. You know what I mean? So if the light was not coming on, then I was having no problems. Uh, but if the but if the red light started to flash here and there, then I would be I would know. It's kind of like you know when you're on hold with the goddamn phone company, and it's like the you got the music on there, and you wait for it to stop. <laughs> it's kind of like that. So I found that really useful. A reverse tuner. Okay, that's a very long-winded answer about the tuner, but it's a deep subject. Jennifer uses one called Tonal Energy. That's it's amazing. It's but it's it's way too complicated for me. This the home screen of it has like four metrics on there that you're looking at at the same time, and it can also it records you and it puts basically on every note in your waveform. It gives you a tracking plus five cents sharp, minus five cents flat along each note. It's a bit much for me, I gotta tell you, but that's what she uses. So. You can really go down the down the rabbit hole with that. Anyway, I like your shirt there, Lisa. <laughs> Did you know that Riverdance, the professional, the, the actual show Riverdance, all the tapping sounds of the feet were taped, pre-taped. I didn't know that because I went to see it when it opened at Radio City Music Hall the first week in the 90s and that's this is a 90s t-shirt so yeah but they had a microphone on the stage for their feet no i was shocked and appalled because i worked for an irish dancing show for four years right we travel all over england and the continent and all that stuff for months at a time it was called the magic of ireland but we called it the tragic of ireland uh because it was ridiculous. I could tell you stories for hours about that thing. We had the the producer shipped a bus over to get us all over our, uh, England and uh, and France and everything. For Ford F-150 uh, airport shuttle bus. We had 95 gigs on that tour. We the the Nelly was her name. Nelly got us to nine of them and got us home from four of them. <laughs> 
<laughs> ridiculous tour. But anyway, yeah, that's what the lead dancer was saying. He was he was saying that they did a recording session, and it's very clever. Four guys did the taps for River Dance <coughs> at the same time, and then they just layered it. So four guys did many goes, and then they just layer those taps. And the reason is is because. Uh, there's just no way everybody can get it right every night. Like, there was 60 people in that cast. There's way too much room for error. So they just, they just, uh, get the people to wear their regular shoes and play the taps and everybody's happy. And if you might notice, Michael Flatley comes out on the stage and leaps across the stage and for some reason he's still tapping. <laughs> I didn't notice that. <laughs> well, that was Lord of the Dance, though. That was Lord of the Dance. Oh. <laughs> anyway, kind of funny. Trivia. Hilarious. Yeah. That was... Playing for that show was a very ridiculous activity. Okay, so what are we working on? we got a whole bunch of stuff, I feel like, that we're working on. You have to remind yeah. me that we teach a lot of people. Yeah? Okay. Um... Uh... You told us last week, it was just Paul and I. Oh, right. Actually. But you told us last week, you know, to gird up our loins because you were going to do something this week that was going to to really work our, our right arms kind of thing. The right arm. Because you didn't say it. <laughs> so did we just practice? I've been dreading that all week. I don't know what you're going to do. <laughs> did we just practice tunes last week? Uh, no, wait, we, we talked about a lot of really important stuff, oh. and uh, it, it's too bad. It's too bad it didn't show up on the video. Like, I, the, the video never showed up. So, oh, really? Um, Shoot. You know, okay. and I'll get it up there. Uh, would have been nice to see. Would have been nice to see. Okay, I'll get it. I'll get it up there. So, I was talking about right arm, though. Yeah, you did mention right arm. Yeah. Okay, that's good. So there's a few things we can do for right arm. Have I talked about the jig rhythm exercise? Uh, no, not right. that I've Do you recall? Okay, so j playing jigs, and we'll, we'll talk about playing jigs and playing reels. Uh, both of them have like a pattern that you do with your arm to get the rhythm out. Because uh, many people talk about playing jigs, but they kind of sound, what people describe it as choppy or or sort of uh, too uh, uh, mechanical, you know, like the kind of like, and it lacks a rhythm. So the way to get the rhythm in a jig is to accent the first and the fourth note in the measure. Beat one and beat four. So one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Kind of like that. So watch my arm when I play a G. Downities and uppities. Here's the downity. Here's the uppity. See that little jogs? And it's kind of this uh, pattern. It's like a, it's like a very natural kind of flopping thing. So my arm moves twice per measure, and my hand does all the rest for me. As a result, like right now, the only muscles I'm firing are in my arm, and the hand is just flopping. See that? Nice, nice flop. So down a tee, up a tee, down a tee, up a tee, down a tee, up a tee. And the swing is how you connect them up. Okay? So when you go, when you make that kind of seamless to the down of each and to the up of each, you get that nice natural rhythm. 
that really gets the arses moving. Okay? And I used it just yesterday because we honored Maureen Mulvey here in Toronto who got Irish Person of the Year. And uh, it was at the Hilton downtown. The mayor was there. Olivia Chow was there, actually, talking about Maureen. And it was such a nice thing. This lady has done everything you wouldn't believe for Irish people in this city, like put on summer camps and dances and, and Gaelic-speaking weekends and all that kind of stuff. And when, when uh, the mayor, Olivia Chow, when she was talking to the crowd, she said, how many people, there was about 500 people at this event. She said, how many people here have been taught dancing by Maureen Mulvey. Every hand went up. It was a beautiful thing, you know? Uh, but anyway, so we had to play Kaylee, and we did jigs, and that's exactly how I was doing them there, with the shukati 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 See that? Now, the the way to get that, first of all, is to do it just on, an old, on, on a double stop. <laughs> Nice loose bow hold that really happens for you whether you want it or not okay now one of the things that people point out when they're starting to get the jig rhythm is that they feel like the bow is going to fly out of their hand and that means that you're doing it right <laughs> make sure you don't let the fly, bow fly out of your hand but other than that that's exactly what you should feel because you're chucking that bow up and you're chucking it down up she goes down she goes the uppity is a lot harder than the down V. Okay, so first of all, let's just try it on the double stop or an open string. Doesn't really matter what you do. The do oh, the double stop is a good workout. And we're just going to go like this. watching everybody as we do this and uh, so David you're doing pretty good you're using about this this much bow no. okay and you could be using yeah. more uh, and that like because we do everything big to small so check out how much bow I use when I do it <laughs> Especially the down bow, get right down to the end there, okay? And I think yeah. that will, uh, I think that will improve things. I can't really see your right hand, so I'm hoping that it's kind of doing the flippy floppy thing. And also, okay. yeah. try and fix the screen here a little yeah, bit. Yeah, a little bit. Okay. That's probably I should do it. That should do it. Uh, and yeah. and so uh, also, you guys should remember that you can look at your own zoom screen. It's it's really good because it's better than a mirror. Because it's not a mirror image, it's a true image, uh, and so it can give you a really good idea of what you're doing. Okay, so so make sure you take take good advantage of that. Paul, uh, you seem to be using about half the bow, and it was the bottom half, the hard half. Okay, so again, try to get that right down to the down the end of your down bow. Yeah, on the on the downity, it looks like this. <laughs> Okay, and I kind of have to chuck it. Watch, watch my hand. See that? Throw it away. <laughs> Throw it away. Anyway, try a little bit more. I want to see your arm. Can't really see your arm anyway. That's better. Yep, that looks pretty good. The other thing is, you want to watch this finger here. You, when you're chucking it, what well, some people have a tendency when they're chucking the bow up to kind of straighten that finger, right? And if you do that, you lose all your bear down power. So they used to say the right arm should be a whip right up to this knuckle because this knuckle has to stay bent around the bow. So kind of like this is the top. See that? Okay, keep it in mind. Might help a little bit with the slippy slippy. Uh, now, Lisa... You were basically staying right down at the bottom. Very difficult to play there. It's Yasha Heifetz territory. It's where all the weight is. It's where your hand is. So you should try to make life easier on yourself. 
and play in the what they call the fiddling sweet spot, which is kind of the upper third, or you use as much of the bow as you can. But I think for you, classic problem with jigs is this. Watch this. <laughs> working your way off the bow. See that? And you'll find all of these grooves have that problem of working your way off the bow. And the, the key to it is just getting a good swift down bow. Okay. Now, did I talk to you guys, talking about the good swift clean down bow, did I talk to you guys about working, how to work on the good swift clean down bow? Did I ever talk about that? I'm going to. <laughs> and I thought you unmuted Lisa. Did you have a question or a c comment? This week, I was experimenting with, I have been, for the past year, when I was taking lessons with that classical bow hole. And so this week, I was experimenting with going up a little bit more. <laughs> like, yeah. And anyway, it was very interesting because on the faster reels, this was very freeing, you know? So I, w I was messing around with like, do I like this or do I like up here? So. And you should mess around. That's exactly what you should do is mess around until, it, until it, you know, because you see lots of people playing up there on the bow, right? Lots of people play up here. Uh, I tend, like, where do I, yeah, I do. And you can tell with me because of my, the dirty, uh, the dirty hair. You see the dirty hair? Because <laughs> well, I have a weird bow hold where my finger kind of goes around the hair and everything for some reason. I don't know why. And so you can see where my finger kind of. Now my finger doesn't go right where the dirt goes because the dirt capillaries. <laughs> so it usually goes about there. So that's it. That's up there. Now my my fingers are still on the grip, right? But it's definitely up there. Now, I always put that down to the fact that fiddlers are mostly playing up in this part of the bow. And when you're playing up in that part of the bow, you really don't need the counteracting agent of your pinky, right? It doesn't, you don't even need to use it. And it actually makes it better because now you can get a dotted quarter note out of your hand without using your arm, right? Nice long sweep. What I noticed, too, was when I went with this player bow grip, I was messing around with the Strathspey, and it was really helping me. So I'm going to experiment right. some more. You should. You should. And, and, and that's what I put it down to. If you're playing up in the upper part of the bow, you really don't need that pinky. Now, you might notice that every time I get past the middle, she gets engaged. Here, I'll show you because you couldn't see there. So down here, it's not engaged. See that? But then as soon as I get past the middle, I gotta I gotta engage it because its only job is this. See that counteracting the weight of the stick. That's all it does. So if I'm here, you don't need that. And you can really creep up on it, you can really go to town. So yeah, now just don't, you know, don't take it to the extreme. Try to find a, a place where you can get most of the bow. The only limiting thing about going up the stick is that you start to lose the part of the bow that you might want to someday use. Because <laughs> you did pay for it. Uh, but it is the hard part. The bottom of the bow is the hard part. So the kind of like this is the easier part then as you get better and better and better you'll be using the whole thing. Now I've been playing at McVeigh's Fine Irish Pub all weekend <coughs> where it is very loud and uh, very drunken. And so I found myself at the bottom of my bow most of the nights, both nights, you know, because the weight is there. And if you know how to use it, it can really take a lot of work out of what you're doing. But if you don't know how to use it, it's just going to crunch away on you and squawk and, and, and give you frustration. See what I mean? So anyway, so I just found that you were really trying to, you were really kind of doing it mostly just with about that much bow. And so it would be better to get right down to the bottom of that down bow and then right back up to the bottom of the up bow. See what I mean? Okay, shall we try it again? Ready? Oh, and then I'll talk about the clean down bow. Okay, ready, go.
these, first of all, everybody looks way better right away. Just those few touches looks way better. Uh, Lisa, you still look a little stiff. You got to loose her up, man. Just loose her up. Just breathe. Try not to think about the pre-recorded taps because it's just disappointing. It's just make it tense. Uh, anyway, so, uh, but everybody else is, uh, everybody could definitely, of course, relax more. We all could. Uh, but uh, it's looking better. Uh, now, I was talking about, uh, uh, as I was doing it, I was started on the D and the A. I switched over to the D and the G, and I felt the difference in work with my left hand, or my right hand, right away. It was, it was unbelievable, like, it's because they're much heavier strings. They're big, heavy strings. And so when you really are bowing with your fingers, you notice that. You notice running into those big bridge cables. That's what my friend Kim used to call them. And pushing them and getting them going. And then when I went over to the high side of the fiddle, the A and the E, a lot more sensitive. I had to lighten up way up right away. See that? So let's do that again. Let's do a little, bit, a little while on the D and the A. And then a little while on the D and the G, and then switch over to the A and the E, and you'll feel all those differences, hopefully. Oh, uh, also, if your bow, if you're looking at your zoom screen, and your bow is going like this, crescent shape bowing, okay, loosen up the grip, okay? The more you tighten the grip, the more the bow follows your arm. See that? If you loosen it up, It'll go straight. Okay, loosen up the grip. Let's try it again. One, two, three, go. should or like it has the possibility of feeling like it should at some point in the future good now once you get the hang of that pattern with your bow then we got to get the fingers into it now you can do it do it a couple of ways so and this is called learning a groove right learning a groove a rhythmic groove is a specialized skill and it can be applied to really anything uh, when you're learning a groove, though, there's, uh, there's a lot that can go wrong that you have to kind of plow through. And so I find that little, there's little things that kind of get in the way of that. So if you're unfamiliar with the tune, right, and you're getting a good groove going, and then you're trying to think, oh, what's the ending? Brakes are on. Groove is over. See what I mean? And then that means you got to restart. It's like riding a bike. You got to restart, get it all going again, you know. So it's really important to either practice a jig groove on jigs that you know so well that you'll never screw up in a million years. Okay? That's the first thing. Or just do a little scale pattern. The one for jigs is called a scale in triplets. And if you've ever, anybody that's ever taken classical music lessons will recognize this. It's not, I didn't make it up. <laughs> So in G major, see that's all that is. And so that's doing a triplet on each note of the scale. Next note. Next note. That's all that is. Very simple pattern for your fingers. And once you get the hang of it, you can kind of turn your brain off. I did years ago. See 
that. You can do that all day long. Some people like it better than the tunes. <laughs> uh, and uh, after a while, that groove just starts to get in that arm. See that? So I find it a really direct way of getting the jig rhythm going. Do you want to give it a try? First of all, let's figure it out. So we'll just go open one, two, and then the next one is one, two, three. And then the next one is two, three, open. You get the idea? Let's go slow and work it out. Open one, two. Ready? Go. One. Understand the concept? Let's do it again. One, two, go. Come down from G, or you can come down from high B, like that, and which is really good because it gives you some practice on your high B. You know, this girl Alice today, she was complaining about the high B because uh, she's playing uh, the cash jig, and they she was getting near the end, and she was like, my neighbors hate this part. <laughs> And it's got the high beat. And when you're not in tune, it's just horrible. That high beat is just horrible. And it doesn't get much practice. Not only that, we don't use our fourth finger ever. It's the only note that we use our fourth finger for. So it's good to practice it. So anyway. Uh, Paul and I both use our fourth finger. I think, Paul, you, you've taken classical lessons, I think, haven't you? So, uh... <laughs> well, that's good. Uh, yeah 20 some odd years ago i don't know it's like i use it i use it to be lazy with my bow changing strings so it's like oh, me you practice too. your fourth finger yeah. but then you yeah. don't practice changing strings with the bow so it's like you, right. you lose out on something either way yeah so the and the deal with the fourth finger it comes up a lot people ask me about it a lot actually because Violinists never use open strings. They find the sound too harsh. Uh, they and and if you there's no question. Like here's an open A. Here's a, 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 a D four. See that? Same note, much warmer. And it's just because it's half the string length. See that's why. Much shorter string to get vibrate. Easier to get vibrating in a warmer sound. But we're fiddle players. We don't want warm. We need to belt out in a, in a loud group of people. We got to get those notes. And also, we want to do this. We don't want to do this. This sounds like shit, you know? So that's why, because our open strings are more like drums, you know, that we hammer on. Uh, so it's a good idea to get into using the open strings as opposed to the fourth fingers because there's a lot more strength. But definitely in a pinch, I use that pinky lots it, like to avoid changing strings or to make everything on one string. You know what I mean? But uh, mostly 
it's for me I always say uh, it's the only thing it does is the high B and decoration grace notes little grace notes that's it uh, but it is good to practice it as a result of that so why don't we try coming down from the high B I'll make sure I'm in tune so you can trust me. Hold on here. No, I was a little sharp. There it is. There's your B. Okay, let's come down. Ready to go. bottom there because we don't have an extra string unless you play a five string fiddle which I don't recommend they sound they you know I've tried a few and they're not really a viola and they're not really a violin so I don't recommend it but anyway so when you get down to the bottom you have to do something jiggy like uh, that's all I do I just do an A B A G everybody understand the concept there let's go all the way up and all the way down little quicker. One, two, go. because then you get less bored, you know? Uh, you're practicing your jig rhythm, let's do it in A today and see what happens, you know what I mean? Uh, so that's a great way to practice jigs. Now let's pick up the pace a tiny bit and do it again. Did you hear how when I was doing it that time, I was really exaggerating the rhythm? I was really kind of belting out that first and fourth note of the, uh, of the beginning of each triplet. So you guys do that too, and you can watch my arm for when I'm belting it out. A little quicker. Yum ba dee title dee dee ba dee title dee one, two, three, go. <laughs> God, 
this thing has been falling off. It's supposed to never fall off. The new generation con never falls off. Anyway, how did that go? Everybody kind of smoothly going through that? Kind of? Yeah, it was tough. It was tough. I, I got lost with the speed. But Getting uh, lost, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. that's easy. That You'll figure that out. How about you, Lisa? How did you get along? When we went fast, I was kind of messing it up. But I will practice it because I was trying to down to be or rashers and sausages. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, so good. Okay, so you can practice. How did you get along, Paul? Yeah, I mean, same, same as David. I just don't have the muscle memory yet, but that's definitely a, a night. It's a, at least it's a little more interesting to practice than just like open, open. You oh, actually yeah. briefly told us, I do remember you just briefly told us about the J, like I'm really happy you're taking a thorough treatment here, but you did briefly tell us about when you told, when you showed us the double stops for, for uh, the D double stops. Okay. Yeah. Double stop. All right. You said, right. you said, you, you said, oh, you can do these with the jig rhythm. And then you just kind of did it once. But I was like, clearly, I never realized that I wasn't actually getting to the tip of my bow. And I'm thinking like, oh, I need to work more on playing in this part of my bow. Like I think to myself, you know, it's like, oh, this, cause this is always so hard for me. And it's not as easy as up here, but it's actually, I've never actually gone to the very end. It seems as much. So it's, and it's a very common thing now so, uh, in the Suzuki method, <laughs> uh, they put a little sticker on the end of your bow, a eh? little white sticker. And it's, I find it really good. Like the girl I was teaching Alice, she's got a sticker on her bow and she's already, she's only been at it for a few months. But she's already going down to the end of the bow almost every time. And I think it's because of the sticker. Because it just catches mm. your eye. You know what I mean? Is that you have to, it's really hard to remember. And everybody, all this technical stuff is like, uh, is like religion. Everybody's good at the beginning of Lent. Right? But then a few weeks from the end, you're kind of backsliding a little bit, deteriorating a little bit. You know what I mean? So it's normal. It's just, and, and the key to getting through it is to just keep at it. And with that being said, let's do it one more time. Yeah. One, two, three, go. the jigs okay so and, and really starting just on a double stop just trying to get that rhythm with the bow and then adding the fingers and then once you get through uh the jig rhythm pattern a few times have a crack at your favorite jig what's your favorite jig let's see let uh how about lisa what's your favorite jig that you can pay, play with your eyes shut and with with boxing gloves on this is more Cliffs of Moher. Perfect. Let's do it. We played that for the Kaylee yesterday. And again, I am going to exaggerate this jig like crazy. So give you something to... You have to exaggerate these techniques when you first start trying to get them if you want a little tiny bit of it to come through. That's what I find. So you got to really overdo it for any of it to come through at all. One, two, three, go!
able to get Jiggy at all? Getting Jiggy <laughs> with it? <laughs> good. So that's what I suggest. That's how you go at jigs. Everybody have a good idea of that? And the the scale in third or in triplets is on my YouTube channel. And I think I do it slowly and fast and all that kind of stuff. So make good use of that. Now that's jigs. Any questions or problems, concerns or complaints about jig bowing? No? It's good for now? Okay, so now let's take a look at reels. Reels are not as easy. That's why I always start with jigs because the the reel, sorry, the jig, the emphasis is on the downbeat. So it goes with your foot. So yumpity tightly, yumpity tightly, See that? Kind of instinctual. It's like even a caveman could do it. <laughs> uh, however, the reel, it's opposite your foot. So it's like deedle dappy deedle dappy deedle dappy dee humba dee and dappy dee da dee. See that? It's a backbeat rhythm, and so it's uh, it's not the downbeat. It's the backbeat. Most people have a lot of problem with the down with the backbeat. It's hard to keep up the backbeat. It always turns around to the downbeat all the time, and uh, that is referenced by I went to a reggae concert once. And uh, it was in Ohio, <laughs> and uh, it was mostly white people in the audience, and the it was Bob Marley and the Whalers, actually. And they started clapping along uh, on the off beats to the tune, getting the crowd to do it. The crowd did it for about, I would say, four bars, and then turned it around to the downbeat. They're all white people. Uh, so most people have a problem with the downbeat. It's just hard to do. Uh, most white people. Whereas, like, I know people from Africa, South America, India, you name it. When they clap along to stuff, it's usually on the backbeat. Uh, whereas us, we kind of, well, I mean, regular white people, it's on the downbeat, right? It's always kind of like that. So we have to change, we have to kind of change that instinct for reels, okay? So I have a couple ways to do it. The other problem is that reels, there are a few ways to bow a reel. There's the single bowed way. Now, I think we talked about this briefly there, David. It's the difference between the, the Cape Breton bowing and the Irish bowing. And uh, so... Yes, we did. Okay. So the Cape Bretoners, they tend to bow every note. They, they go down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up. Whereas the Irish guys are lazy <laughs> and they put everything in the up bow except the backbeat. Now the tune that I always use to illustrate the two different ways you can approach this are, is the Star of Munster. Has anybody ever heard of the Star of Munster? It's a very popular A minor tune. Uh, and uh, we play it not only it's an Irish tune, but we play it in Cape Breton. Everybody does. It's, it's been played in Cape Breton for a long time. And so when I was growing up playing it, oh my God. I've been using hot glue a lot lately on my dust collecting thing. Maybe I should glue this damn thing on my fiddle. No, I'm not going to. <laughs> okay, Star of Buster in the Cape Breton style. kind of Cape Breton kind of like chaka 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 and it's got a bit of chop to it it's not quite as smooth but it's got a lot of drive to it right and you use lots of bow you're going to get them arses moving uh, whereas in the Irish style here it is in the Irish style <laughs> Very smooth. It's all smooth and right out. Yes, David. So uh, that's basically your Georgia Shuffle. Yeah, this, they call it the Longbow. It's got many names. Yeah. The, the bluegrass guys, they really do it, eh? The, like, the, I like. Uh... <laughs> Oh my god. 
geez, it just gets yeah, so you your so basically your your foot is beating one and three. Your bowing pattern is doing two and four. Yep, it's be it's the Beatles. Tick attack, tick attack, tick attack. That's all it is, right? But that's in the the two ways of doing it are significant because the single bowed way is hard to do because basically for most people it comes out like this. See that? Which kind of like and it's because when you're single bow in that shuffle you got you do that big down you do that big down beat, uh, bow for the back beat but then you got to get back up without making a great big sound because you want that one to be unaccented so you have to lighten right up on the bow see that and that's why you get that little you hear that little kind of thing where the volume drops down on it why that's there it's a very distinctly Cape Breton thing are you hearing that very Natalie and Ashley kind of Sam buddy kind of sound that little that little gasp in the music there and it really helps um, but it's hard so I find the longbow pattern that the Irish people do a lot more accessible because if you bow the Star of Munster with everything in the up bow except the backbeat it's going to sound like an Irish reel, whether you try or not. It's just the way the bowing is. Watch. I'm not going to do anything, I swear. It just does it for you. And so for some people, it can force the issue. And then, when you finally get over that hump of backbeat, you can play with it. You can do stuff with it. You can do it both ways. You can, so, you know, that's, that's, I find what, or do what most of us do, which is alternating. That was straight up. One way and the other way, one way and the other way. And that's kind of forms the basis for most Celtic fiddle, you know, is the mixture of the two. Okay. Now, check it out. You want to practice it on a tune, or sorry, on, on, a, on a pattern, so you don't have to think of a tune. You have this, the real scale pattern, and it's, it's, this is not new, it's an old exercise. <laughs> Once you get the pattern, you can really work on that rhythm. So let's try figuring out the pattern. So it's very simple. It's kind of like the scale in triplets, but it's an extra note added. Go back to the note you started on. See that? And then one, two, three, one. Just doing straight, uh, straight bowing. Just straight bowing to start with. Yes. Da, 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 da. Yeah. Yeah. I call that downy uppy. Okay. Yeah. Okay, we'll go slow so we can figure out the fingers. A uh, one, two, three, go. One. 
that's the top. Okay? Now let's try coming down. Ready? Go! Yeah, I'm in. Back to the three. Same thing at the end. We don't have an extra string, so you got to figure something out to do at the end. That's all I do. So everybody able to figure out that pattern? Let's do it again. Ready, two, three, go. Once you understand the concept, it's really easy. You don't have to think about it very much, and that's the point. Now, do you think we could try it a little faster? Take a breather. A little faster. I'll tell you a story. A little fast. I'll tell you a, a story about the van before we go yeah. a little faster. Uh, so, uh, on one of the trips, uh, we were trying to play in the Isle of Man. Do you guys know about the Isle of Man, the little island that all the exiles have been on? off the coast of England, and it's a crazy place. It's like Las Vegas of Britain, you know? Like, they got these pubs. One of them's called the Quids Inn, where everything's a, a, a pound. Pints of beer are a pound, right? And you're just, like, getting wasted. Man. And then they have a system where if you're being unruly, you get the yellow card, and if you're being really unruly, you get the red card, and you're out, right? So anyway, so we're going over to play on this crazy little place, and we're trying to get to... Uh, 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 what do you call it? Liverpool to get the boat, and it's in the middle of the night, and we're and we've just finished the show, and we're bombing across the island to get to Liverpool, and the headlights stop working, just right out of, out of the blue, no headlights. So Dave, uh, the bus driver, uh, he pulls the bus over, 
and he's like, well, the headlights are not working, and uh, I guess we're going to have to wait for it to get light. <laughs> so we're all sitting there at the side of the motorway, and October, the music director, knew that I was a car person, came from car people, and worked in a garage once and stuff, and she's like, Dan, do you think you can fix it? Like, do you think you do something? And I was sleeping at the time. I was asleep. She wakes me up. She's like, fix the van. And I'm like, oh, my God. And so I went out with the sound man, and we had these wires, and we, we ended up jumping the headlights directly to the battery, you know. But it was raining. It was dark. We couldn't find the battery. And I remember the sound man says, it's the getting to Liverpool that grieves me. <laughs> <laughs> And he was right. Oh my god, what a disaster. Oh, anyway, there you go. Let's try her again, a little quicker. Just a little bit of a push. One, two, three, go. from the high B. when I was doing it that for every one of those two and fours I was getting right to the end of my bow. See that? That's going to be the really important thing with this exercise because accents come from bow speed. So if you practice getting to the end of your bow on the two and the four when we go faster the accent's going to come out. You see what I mean? Now, before we started talking about the reel, I mentioned the swift, clean down bow. All of these grooves, whether it's the jig groove or the reel groove, depend on a swift, clean down bow. And sometimes I, su I surprise people by getting them to give me a swift down bow, and they're surprised how bouncy and cr uh, crunchy and squawky it, really, it actually is. Uh, so, uh, especially when you try it after a great big long slow up bow, which is what we have to do most of the time. So what I get, oh my god. <laughs> time for a commercial. <laughs> don't, don't buy coon. <laughs> don't buy the damn coon, they're full of shit, it falls off every time. <laughs> Anyway, so uh, uh, the swift clean down bow. Watch mine. And again, on a double stop is best. See that? Oh, that was a good belter. Do you hear the strength coming out of that there? So that was kind of like, I'm, it's almost like I'm hitting the, drum, the, the fiddle like a drum. Because it sinks in and it comes off like that. Oh, that was a good one too. Nice belty notes there. See that? Try a few on your own and you tell me about it afterwards because I can't hear you. So, so no, no, no. A big up bow. Up, big up, a slow up bow. And then... Yeah, like that. And it hit it. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. How about you, Paul? How's yours? Not bad. Now, it looks a little heavy-handed. That's the only thing. Look at how light, even though it's a very strong note, look at how light this bow is. See if I can get a good angle. You 
can't tell, but it's very light. Take my word for it. I got no weight on it at all. Because remember, the faster you move the bow, the more it digs in on its own. Right? Remember that. It's like an old tr pickup truck with no weight in the back. The faster you go, the more the arsen digs into the ground. So you got to make sure you really lighten up so it's not heavy handed. And how about yours, David? How is yours? Not bad. Now, I'll tell you something you might not be aware of. Your elbow is in the game a little bit. It's going like this. See that? And you want to keep that from doing that. Now, that is a classic thing about finishing your down bows and up bows. When you're finishing the up bow, your elbow doesn't do it, your hand does. See that? So what's happening with you is you get about here and your arm does the rest. Okay, same with the down bow. I didn't see your down bow, but on the down bow this is what it looks like. See that? Just at the ends. Now that's a very good sign because it means you're, you're, you're working on it and it's something that starts to pop up as you get better with your bow. The important thing is to notice it now. So no elbow at all. Stationary elbow and you can take advantage of the rest of that bow. Okay, let's try this scale pattern one more time before we're done. A little quicker, tiny bit quicker. A one, two, three, go. the video of tonight's class uh, I encourage you which I will do and if I forget please remind me I, I have to post a lot of stuff and I forget uh, anyway uh, uh, look at yourself okay look at your own right arm see if you're getting down to the end of the bow see if you're getting up to the end of the bow uh, because it's a really good indication of, of how you're doing with it and it's a way to kind of jump the gun and get the process going a little quicker so look at yourself while you're doing it um, I was going to say, uh, oh yeah, the longbow. So now, I'm just going to demonstrate it. Everything in the up bow except the back beat. Shall we try it? I'll just try to yell it out as we go. Up, up, down, up, 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 down. Ready, two, three, go. 
use a week to just get that pattern under your fingers but if you get confused go on my youtube channel the real bowing pattern the jig bowing pattern it's all there you can just kind of go and, and re re uh, visit it if you forget how to do it and uh, and then next week we're going to try it we're going to get into that a little bit more and we're also going to try to alternate between the two because that's going to be the real goal is to alternate between the two okay now, how's everybody doing? Any questions, problems, or, you know, I can't play. I had poor one of my students texted me today. She's trying to play something with her choir at the, at her church, and, and it was a practice yesterday. She texted me today and said, I'm crying, and I feel like I should give up. <laughs> poor thing. <laughs> Anybody crying and feel like they should give up? That's good. Any questions? Okay, there's enough to digest there, eh, between the two things. And I recommend that you kind of pick a day for jigs, pick a day for reels. Okay, so I think that's the best way to do it. All right, and we'll reconnoiter next week. Yes? I have a question. Okay. Yes, Lisa? Do you um, have an idea of what tunes we'll look at next week? Uh, well, we'll do more work on this on these patterns. And we'll t we'll pick uh, the uh, what did you say the Cliffs of Moher was the one that you were really familiar with so let's do let's do that for the jigs so work on the Cliffs of Moher and for reels now let's see so Lisa picked her jig what would be yes uh, let's hear what you would say there David actually I'm I'm gonna make I'm gonna make what's probably Paul's suggestion uh, I'm gonna say John Brennan. Yeah, perfect, actually, because it's mostly eighth notes. Yeah, because John Brennan works really well with, with that. That's what we'll do. Yeah, so I, practice I, John I, Brennan. Okay, because, again, we don't want anything to get into the, in the way of this groove. You don't want to wonder what the next note is. You don't want to wonder what the next phrase is. You want to just be able to set her on autopilot and just go for it. Okay? Tape that throttle open. <laughs> Okay, guys, you got lots to work on. We'll see you next Monday. Okay. Bye. Bye.